Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is time for our bi-weekly women's hockey spotlight, and that means we bring in Erica L. Ayala. Erica, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure to have you here. And uh, big news, the PWHL schedule is out. What stands out most from the schedule for you? Well, we talked about it on the on the last spotlight. We were wondering, right, Rachel, when the season yeah. might start because we didn't really have any clear indication. Were they going to start a little bit closer to what we would consider a traditional hockey season or were they going to start with what they did last year? I guess we got the answer. It's a little bit in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. So things will kick off for the PWHL uh, Saturday, November 30th. Toronto will host the Boston Fleet. I think what also stands out to me, of course, is knowing that the uh, Boston Fleet will host the Minnesota Frost on December 4th. So that will be the first time we get the rematch of the two teams that play played in the first ever PWHL final. Of course, what also stands out is that they have names now, Gil. We have some new arenas for a lot of the teams. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to see what this means for year two, especially because a lot was made, Rachel, about attendance last season. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. First off, um, the Boston fleet, they exist. Interesting. Ah. Um, <laughs> That's an if you know women's out. soccer, you know where <laughs> Rachel's going with that. Oh dear, what a nightmare of a rollout that was. <laughs> I know. Um, at, at any rate, yeah, I think it is really good that they're getting started earlier than maybe some people expected, you know, at the mm -hmm. tail end of November. Um, the schedule also has some complexities, as women's hockey schedules have traditionally done, because they build themselves around international breaks. And I think you know, the Four Nations Cup and the the Olympics participation on the NHL uh, side aside, I think that it is interesting that this league is still wrapping itself around international breaks. And at what point is the balance of power going to change here? And I, I just think that's something to keep an eye on. But for now, the schedule is still takes that into consideration. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point that you bring up because actually in the league that a lot of people consider Gil to be kind of the premier, the gold star on the women's side, the WNBA, who's in the throes of its finals right now, they haven't quite figured that out either. And the answer, at least for the WNBA, has always been to, especially now with um, a prioritization clause, Gil, has been for them to prioritize domestic play, even for those players who come from outside of not just the United States, but basically North America overall. And that's something that has been in contention, especially as the WNBA, again, might be the gold star, but the other leagues have rapidly caught up to the WNBA and even surpassed them when it comes to salary. What do you think the players feel about that? What is their priority or for most of them? Yeah, that's a really great question. I do think, especially because it's so early that the, the and the PWHL is such a player driven kind of movement that turned into a league that they are still going to prioritize international play. Now, as things get more congested because women's sports is on, oh my goodness, broadcast TV, linear TV more often, they might have to be innovative with their with their schedule to hit broadcast windows because unless we're going to start getting ESPN 23 uh which who knows maybe that will be a thing uh you know there's just not as much real estate now that people are taking women's sports in earnest and placing it on network TV so it's going to be interesting and and also that might shift because we've seen it shift again in the WNBA. We've seen it shift in the NWSL, which we were kind of clowning on a little bit uh, ago. But the, the point is that, the or the truth of it is, and it's always been the truth on, on, on the side of, of, of men's sports, it feels like, that there are very 
finite, limited amount of roster spots on international teams. And if you are having an ongoing product and that product starts, stops with an international window and not what is happening domestically, eventually that could be a problem. Now, I don't think it's going to be an issue right now, but something to keep an eye on because, again, we've seen that the tides have shifted pretty pretty significantly in the last handful of years um, and always something to keep an eye out on. But, uh, you know, another thing that we want to talk about, speaking about um, the the start to the season and international play, we have an international player in Natalie Spooner, who unfortunately had such a great season last year, gets injured deep into the playoffs. ACL, which is uh, uh, even a few years ago, that was the kiss of death for anyone. Uh, and, you know, in hockey, you you, you kind of need your knees. <laughs> you kind of need them. They're important. Um, but we are hearing that Spooner Rachel is really aiming for that November 30th and to be ready for that game. The Toronto Scepters will be taking on, as I mentioned, the Boston fleet at Coca-Cola Coliseum. Yeah, and she's just been a mainstay in women's hockey for forever. Um, you know, she was even goes back to the CWHL days. Yep. Um, and I, I think that uh, to have her continue to play this game even through this injury is remarkable. Um, you know, she she goes back to the the Toronto Furies. And uh, to have her play for the now the Toronto Scepters in the PWHL, it continues her legacy mm -hmm. in Toronto and as sort of a, a really important bridge between kind of old women's hockey and the new women's hockey. Sure. And so I think it's um, it, it's really <sighs> remarkable. And I think it's important that, uh, you know, she be given a shot to to really get back into it this year. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if, if she's able to keep up with that timeline. As you mentioned, Natalie Spooner, among so many others, just been a pioneer of women's hockey. Uh, we have seen a lot of pioneers, uh, you know, especially with the turnover that happened in women's hockey, um, you know, like a, a Madison Packer, a camp invite, not added. To the, I, you know, I just don't know what it's going to take for, I almost said PWHL New York, but they are the sirens now. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm very curious to see, you know, Jillian Dempsey also got a little bit lost in the sauce in PWHL, just, uh, and also didn't end up in Boston. Who Everyone was very surprised by that. Right. Um, you know, so a player like Spooner, uh, we know Hillary Knight, of course, Kendall Coyne Schofield, Elise Steckline, those players are really carrying the banner. And what also is important to the point, Gil, you and I were talking about is that they're also international players. So it's it's interesting, just going back to that point, this league right now, at least, is definitely skewing towards international names. So that leads me to believe that at least for now, they're going to stick with uh, kind of dancing around the international calendar. Yeah, yeah I think the um, the interesting turning point could be are is the IIHF going to change when women's worlds are in the spring mm -hmm. and push it a little later the way that men's worlds are mm -hmm. so that, you know, players can play a complete season without taking a three week break and coming back for like a week or two of games and then the playoffs like that is a really difficult kind of calendar to maintain. So um, that that's the question I'm going to ask moving forward. Would you prefer that they do it before men's world simultaneously with, or after not, I'm not saying it should have anything to do with men's worlds. I'm saying before okay. the end, it should happen at the end of the PWHL season rather than during it. Right. 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 Yeah. And I think it, it will also be an interesting conversation. Again, one that we're having across women's sports, across sports overall. What is the true saturation between, you know, dedicated M NHL fans and PWHL fans? What does that look like? And, um, you know, <laughs> then there's, of course, football, because everyone has to worry about football. You know, <laughs> nobody can ever dare to play when football plays. So, of course, I am uh, being sarcastic, facetious, whatever, all of the things, sassy. You know, another thing, and I think we maybe talked about this because I had a conversation with... Um, with Jaina Hefford and 
we were able to chat about some of the things regarding the rule book. Um, and as the PWHL maybe experiments talking once again about international hockey with how uh, contact is going to go, especially checking open ice, checking things of that nature, body checking. And one of the things that Jaina told me in that conversation, conversation, I guess almost a year ago now is that they wanted to be able to, um, create pathways for former women's ice hockey players into officiating that then could also uh, open up roles for them in the PWHL. And so we have an announcement of not just the officiating roster, um, you know, which is, is going to see 38 women and 27 men overall, but also, you know, a little bit more of, a development for these officials, there is going to be a uh, officials camp that will happen at the end of um, in Denver, I should say. Um, and this is something again, that Jaina Hefford talked to me about. And so to see it coming to fruition, they couldn't quite get it together uh, for that first season but it was definitely something that Jaina wanted to talk about. And officiating, as we know, Gil, is something that people are always going to have an opinion about. No. But I, I, I know, right? So wild. But I, I like this idea, Gil, of being able to have all of the officials come together, not only to provide development and pathways for those moving forward, but quite honestly, to get some of the folks, especially who are not familiar with women's hockey, on board with what again body contact looks like in this league yeah and that's important you got to set a standard and it has to be as uniform as possible across the league if you get all the officials more or less on the same page that creates a consistent product it, it makes a lot of sense yeah for sure and i mean rachel i think as we continue to see women's hockey grow and a lot of people putting a lot of faith in the PWHL that this can be the league with staying power, I wonder also how this impacts how we see women rising in the ranks in other areas of hockey overall. Of course, Jessica Campbell is with the Seattle Kraken now as a full-time bench boss came up with uh, Disco Dan Bilesma and his staff. Um, but, you know, are we going to be able to see officials at the NHL level? Are there other roles where we still haven't had women be able to occupy those spaces where maybe things like this and the PWHL continuing to create these opportunities then, uh, you know, trickles into other areas of the sport? Yeah, I, I think it's really important. And you know, maybe some like cross pollinization between the NHL and the PWHL in terms of goal of officials and, and their development and finding ways to learn from each other and, you know, and get opportunities for all these people and to really, you know, showcase the PWHL as a career path for officials as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we know there's so many elite women's hockey players that coaching, even coaching was difficult to get a pathway there. It's starting to open up again, mentioned, excuse me, Jessica Campbell earlier. And the, the, the start again, stop again of women's hockey has also offered opportunities to players like Angela James, Geraldine Heaney in the past, you know, Carla McLeod. These are legendary names in all of them, actually Canadian. Uh, no, no, no offense to any of the uh, U.S. players, but I mean, uh, you know, this is an opportunity, hopefully, um, to create a better product on the ice in the here and now with the camp that they held, but yeah. also again, a pathway and a pipeline. I know that was something that Jaina Hefford was, um, you know, really excited about. So we might have to follow up with Jaina and see what else is coming down the pipeline as far as innovative ways to make more pathways for women in hockey. But, uh, you know, until our next spotlight, we will be getting closer and closer to the start of the season and should be able to give more updates once we know uh, what the camps are, are really looking like for all of the teams. Erica, I know you'll have your finger on the pulse of that as the season gets closer. Great talking a little women's hockey with you and thank you very much. Thank you.